This is Dr. Fox. Thank you all for your continued support for CRPN and CRPN Central. For more information about our mission, please contact us today at info at crpaynet.com for details. All right. After months of work, the site is finally open for business. Ready or not research, here we come. Hey, you have a nice looking site. I bet you enroll a lot of patients. Have you ever considered some technology solutions to help your business's productivity? Hmm, heard about site technology. It's impressive, but I've heard that it's expensive. Well, we are a business and we are driven to make money. However, we can offer you a lot of- Congratulations, Site. You were just awarded a trial, and the sponsor has paid us to bring to you their preferred solution. Let's get started. See, the sponsor has technology. You need technology to balance it. I suppose. This just seems like so much. Congratulations, Site. You were just awarded a trial, and the sponsor has paid us to bring to you their preferred solution. Let's get started. Now, before we get too far in, let me show you our latest solution. The- Our Okay. 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 Hey, stop. Okay, that's it. Look, I- I appreciate everything you all are trying to bring to the table here. But when it comes to performing these trials, it's my neck on the line. Not the sponsors, and not the vendors. Thank you for your offers, but for now, I think it's best to stick with the processes that I know will work. I'll reach out if I have any questions. Technology. Concentrated innovation that holds an infinite potential to improve our lives and a disastrous fate if it is wielded improperly. Clinical research sites are bombarded by new and innovative e-thingies from their inception. And while the intentions are good, the chaos of technology selection and a utilization of talk-down tech can rapidly become maddening, even for our most organized and progressive sites. Sites, take a deep breath. As much as they insist, the choice to use technology for your trial performance is completely up to you. Don't be bullied into sponsored technology that compromises your quality and know that it is your legal and regulatory right to do so. Sponsors, sites are not looking a gift horse in the mouth when you spring for study-specific technology, but please know that for many sites, it does far more harm than it does good. Work with your sites, listen to them, and please, be flexible with their technology logistics for better trial performance and, as a result, better quality for your data. If we can align our technology efforts holistically, we will accomplish far more than our current tug-of-war state of broken communication, misdirected development, and an overall waste of money for everyone involved. Welcome to CRPN Central, the official podcast of the Clinical Research Payment Network. I'm your host, Dr. Daniel Fox. CRPN Central discusses the real issues with our clinical research industry to explore and identify mutually beneficial solutions for all of our stakeholders. Clinical research sites are inundated with new technology and innovation, not only by sponsors who provide study-specific solutions, but also by vendors who are looking to sell their product to the front lines. As innovative and helpful as these single-point solutions may be, they can be overwhelming, rejected even, by some sites who are assumed or expected to use them. In an industry that is continuously pushing the innovation envelope in products and processes, how may we improve the utilization of tech stack expectations for our clinical research sites? Today, we will discuss tech stack innovations for clinical research sites, defined as the belief in adoption of technology collections used to develop logistical clinical trial performance at locations where clinical research and development are tested in a safe and ethical manner. First, we will speak with a site director who is currently exploring the great technology frontier Then, we will speak with a vendor dedicated to accommodating clinical sites with flexible and innovative technology. To maintain valid comparisons, both interviews will use the same questions, and my guests did not know the questions before the interviews. We will reconvene after the interviews, compare guest responses, and perhaps identify best strategies to understand site technology expectations in the industry. Our first guest has worked on the front lines and experienced industry technology for many years. Ashley Mitchell is the Vice President of Strategic Partnerships at Arizona Neuroscience Research in Scottsdale, where she and an amazing team of physicians and staff are leading the way to bring research opportunities to communities who need them most. Ashley is an amazing and knowledgeable leader in our industry, and I am so thankful she has taken the time to speak with us today. Please welcome with me 
Miss Ashley Mitchell. Ashley with an E before the L Mitchell. Thank you so much for coming on to CRPN Central today. Hey, Dr. Fox. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to be here. For anyone who didn't watch your awesome Ashley mentory on exercise and mental health, would you be willing to introduce yourself to the audience? Sure. My name is Ashley Mitchell. I am the clinical research manager and vice president of strategic partnerships for Arizona Neuroscience Research here in Phoenix, Arizona. And yes, exercise is a huge part of how I take care of my mental health. And I'm a really strong advocate for mental health. So Ashley, you're a part of Arizona Neuroscience. Yes. And you direct the site? I do. I direct the site. I do everything from coordinating if there's like a visit that's not covered by one of our team members, I'm delegated to do everything from lab draws to processing the labs, anything that falls under a visit. But what I do mostly besides be there as a mentor for my team, I run all of our books. I negotiate all of our contracts. I go back through and audit an inspection of what has been paid, what hasn't been paid. And I do all of the collecting. At that level, are you at a point where you are doing exploration or strategic leadership? Yes. Are you seeing any kind of a different change in the processes of the site or even maybe the processes that are expected of you as a site to be competitive? I've seen them change since I started here. The previous manager did things a certain way, but as time kind of prevails, I've started looking at different vendors to see what are the expectations of the site as far as payments go. And then what could a clinical trial management system, how could that help our site? As you explore this, there's so many different options out there as far as technology goes. If you ever been to a conference, they sell out in booths from vendors who are trying to sell technology to sites. Well, I'm really excited. So your conference at SOS in Tucson. So that was my very first conference that I got to go to. And I'm actually really excited to see what the vendors are offering whenever I go to SCRS Hollywood at the end of September. So I'm really looking forward to meeting with people there and seeing what's offered because our site currently is in a position we're growing very quickly and with almost most 20 studies in all different phases, we are looking to see how we can streamline our processes and make things more efficient and making things a little easier on people from a finance perspective. If this is your first SCRS and to anyone out there who has never been to an SCRS conference, SCRS is by far like the Oscars of clinical research. If you are a clinical research site, I would highly, highly recommend taking the trip to SCRS and just mingling with some of these people people who come together, they're literally dedicated and passionate. It is their lifeblood to make sure that sites have what they need to succeed. It's a phenomenal experience. I'll be there. I can't wait to see you there. I know. Me too. It's exciting. Today's conversation is about tech stack expectations to our clinical research sites. That is when you start in this industry and you start looking around, there's, well, do you have this technology? That technology is like this giant grocery list of all these things that you're just expected to have miraculously pay for and be prepared for like a competitive clinical trial performance. I'm going to ask you a series of questions today. And I've already asked these questions to another individual. We're going to compare your answers to what this other individual said. And we're going to maybe find some alignment in how we can address tech stack expectations to sites, maybe how we can manage them and make the industry a much better place to work in and to be productive in. Do you have a lot of technology at your site right now? Everything was paper source when I came, including all of the investigator site file. We implemented an e-regulatory system, which was really awesome. We still use an e-reg system today. However, we did transition from the initial one we used for about a year and a half to something a little bit more updated and something that kind of felt more like a vault. We don't ever want to lose files. While we do wet ink delegation logs and we do wet ink signatures for a couple of really pertinent government documents, we use e-reg for everything else. So the investigators that aren't here full-time raiders, those people can be anywhere in the country or the world and have an internet connection and log in and sign these really important documents that it's time sensitive. What an amazing transition. Yeah. What are the current tech stack expectations of our clinical research sites? I always get asked the question, can you give me the process of how you monitor the temperature of your investigational product? That is something that I implemented immediately. We need to make sure that we have 24 hour monitoring. I know Back in the day, one time a day of checking your temperature monitoring device, and then we would record that temperature and that would be it. But really people now, especially pharmaceutical sponsors, they're wanting to see that there's 
a 24 hour monitoring of that investigational product. We have temp stick and temp stick is a 24 hour monitoring system. I have it set up to alert all the coordinators and myself via email and with me personally text if it even gets within a degree to potentially be a deviation. And that's been really, really helpful because I can be at the site typically within a couple of minutes of receiving a notification or I can ping another investigator and ask them to come and do it just to see what's going on. Maybe it's after five and the housekeeping ended up setting the temperature gauge differently. So it gets a little warmer in the building. So then I get to call the property manager and let them know we need to make sure we have these processes in place. That was the best thing that we could do is implement something like a 24 hour monitoring system. And that really pleases the sponsor. We see this anywhere else, even it's all about instant got to be 24 seven instant. There is no lull. It's always, we have to know everything at all time. That is putting the sites under some pressure now where it's not like you can just go in and check a temp log once a day, even on the weekends with a paper log anymore. You can still get away with it, but the quality standards are increasing on a technology level. And as a result, those expectations are getting higher. Right. It seems like sometimes when it comes to tech stacks, we almost have to separate into two different kinds of tech stacks. One tech stack is, as you were saying, you chose to use a 24 seven temp log. Yes. And that can be part of your tech stack. Many times there are expectations placed upon sites where they don't get to choose. It. It's sponsor chosen. Sponsors tell sites, this is what we are using for our trial. You need to use this. What would be an example of sponsor selected tech stacks that are expected on sites? Oh, I would say eConsent, ECOA, having all of the different scales on a tablet for you to use whenever you're doing specific scales with patients, especially like patient reported outcomes. We have general EDC, CTMS, and thankfully that gives them real-time data anytime they want it, they have access to it. Another thing I want to back up for just a second is, is we always get asked if we have an EMR. Yep. In case you're integrated into a hospital or something. Uh -huh. Or if we're integrated in a clinic, which we have a clinic attached to our clinical research site. So sometimes they just expect that we have an EMR, but we're not actually part of that other business. So that is not our EMR, but we do make sure that they have a copy of our SOP so that they know how we obtain the medical record and how they'll have access to it. That would be a site stack because sites would be controlling that. On average, how many different portal logins would you have given to you by the sponsor? Okay, we have the EDC, we have the IXRS, which is how we like, you know, randomize our patients. If we have a tablet, then we have that. If we have a patient phone that they have to use to be able to log the patient in, and we also have to have the site login for the tablet as well. We have of the e-consent, which is in a different tablet, payment portals to pay the subjects and payment portals to pay the site, which are different with two different logins <laughs> for the same study, which is really interesting sometimes because I'm like, wait, so I have a spreadsheet that not only keeps up with all of my credentials, but then it also keeps up with what does what for which study. Because when you get to 20 studies, when you get to five studies and you have that many different logins and different usernames, it becomes a cluster if you don't end up having it really neat and tidy in a document somewhere that only you can access. There are so many expectations of our sites to manage, maintain, operate, create logistics around technology. It's just absolutely insane. What are the challenges that we face with the current tech stack expectations for our sites, both internal and external? Well, I think the biggest thing is, is when there's any type of tech issue, while we have a subject or a participant in-house on site waiting. The screening visit's already four to six hours long. We're trying to do everything as efficiently as possible. We do everything that we need to do, preparing up to the day of sources ready, medical records are ready. You have so much that's already going to consume that time, but then you get to the e-consent and the tablet doesn't work. Mm -hmm. The sponsors emphasized over and over how important it is to get that e-consent. And we try and we try and we try again. Something isn't working. That is 20 minutes to an hour of time that ends up getting used for something that's not even really efficient for the site or the subject or the study. And it becomes a huge hurdle when that happens over and over again. And this isn't just e-consent. This happens with our skills. This happens whenever we get a provider. We have a 10 or 15 minute slot that the provider can see the participant for a scale that only an MD or DO is delegated to do. And we get in there with our tablet and the login credentials work fine. The provider's all logged in and ready to go. And and then the right skill 
well populates for the wrong visit. Or I can just list so many things. And then not only is that 15 minute block of time not available 15 minutes later, it's like there's more time that's been used doing something completely counterproductive to what we're trying to do. When there is an issue, it's almost like a domino effect of more issues that are caused by it because the time that it's eaten up, we can't get that time back in there seeing their patients in their clinic and then trying to come over and see participants at our site. And I mean, you can just imagine how many different conflicts arise from that. And I guarantee you the sites don't get paid for that at all. No. I have seen that so many times. A patient is in a doctor's office. We're ready to randomize them. It's the last day of enrollment. And guess what? IVRS or IVRX is down. And so now we've got a coordinator on the phone for three hours to the help center trying to get this to work. I ran into a situation where I could not invoice for a trial for six months because I was not allowed to gain access to the payment portal because I was not the sponsor. Yeah, we had that happen as well at our site. When I first started here, I remember we were told they wouldn't be able to receive invoices for six months while they were transitioning from one portal to another. It wasn't well received by upper management. Let's just leave it at that. That's almost a breach of contract. Yeah, show me in the contract where we agreed to that provision. Right. It seems like a lot of the problem is a result of sites, the organizations that are the end users to this technology, simply simply being what some tech people might consider drones, end users. They don't have the ability to be super users to manage their site. They have to depend on other people to give them credentials, to do things for them, to troubleshoot. So sites do not have the technology capabilities to literally operate their organization. They're fully dependent on these broken systems and therefore have to spend a ton of time in bad technology. Right. And we do everything in our power to grow with the times. But sometimes after you just continue to see that it doesn't work time after time after time, this is exhausting. Like you said, we don't get paid for the additional manpower. We don't get paid for that time lost. And that eats into other things that we could be doing. We're running a business, so it needs to be streamlined as efficiently as possible. So it makes us just want to say, no, we're not going to use that technology. Can you at least provide us a backup paper document so that if we run in into that, then we have the skill that we could perform on paper. And then once we get the system back up and running, that data can be transcribed. Now I have been able to prove after multiple email correspondence with our CRAs or the CTM to say, look, this is kind of what happened since this is something that's a continued pattern. Can we please get copies of all of these skills onto paper that's been IRB approved that we can present to our patients should we have an issue with tech that we can't use the provider? tablet and they have done that and that's awesome but then you go into queries and they need DCFs <laughs> and all of the data correction that you could imagine because there is a timestamp that's different than the actual time and date on the form <laughs> So now downstream, it becomes even more of a nightmare. Yeah, it is. Don't forget when it comes to these third parties that are paid for by sponsors and offered to sites, what happens if something really bad happens? Timestamps happen incorrectly or heaven forbid someone gets sued. Whose fault is it? Who's indemnified? What would happen if something bad went going on and we use these third party tech vendors? Would they take the fall or the blame in the event that they dropped the ball? I don't believe they would. And so now they're kind of in this sweet spot where sites would take the fall for something they did wrong. And it's unfortunate, but I do see that the ball is dropped. It has nothing to do with the site's responsibility, but the site ends up having to create a protocol deviation for it or something that makes the site look bad, but it was outside of the scope of what the site could actually do. The decision and the outcome were dependent upon someone outside of the site, but the site took the fall for it. And it really sucks in that case. And then who gets the 483 or who gets the next award or doesn't get the next award because of the performance of the trial. It's not that third party vendor. No. It's the site. Sites are told they have to use things and then their hands are tied to control the quality and then they just get beaten up because of the actions of other companies. Right. Communication is key to everything. When we're even considering a study, we get all of this information up front and a lot of times they don't even have that information yet. They're still writing the protocol, but we're actively selecting sites because we know we're 
going to hit the ground running soon. And I'm talking about anything from an observational study to something that's phase two. But you would think that's something that they would present as part of their selection process. These are the portals that we use. Do you all have experience using these? How does this benefit you as a site? And how does it benefit the sponsor? Because when we don't find out that information until the site initiation visit or two days before the site initiation visit, it doesn't give us the information that we need to adequately be set up to perform the study to the best of our ability. Pace makes waste. Yes. There are some sites out there that assess technology, the tech stack of the sponsor, on whether or not they want to even accept the trial. For example, if there's a site out there and they say, well, we learned that you use this bottom of the barrel EDC and it's going to take us quadruple the time to enter the data, we don't want the trial. It's very much a factor of feasibility when it comes to the selection of tech on a trial. Agreed. What are the benefits of the industry's tech stack expectations right now? It's not all bad. We are so grateful for even just being able to see what's out there if we ever do decide to implement it for our site. I definitely think that some of the more seasoned EDCs that have been around for a while are really easy to use. Their processes have been updated and it is super user-friendly for the site. Another perk of being able to use EREG is that we can access it from anywhere, anytime, and anyone can do that as long as they have their login credentials. That has made so much of what we do from a day-to-day basis easier because we don't have to bring that investigator in to the site in order to sign something. When we can pay a subject, when I don't have to pull out a checkbook and write reimbursement for the subject's time and travel, that compensation goes straight into a payment portal and it gets uploaded to a card. As long as it works and the card has the actual payment loaded on it, then we're great. The participant loves it. Matter of fact, they would rather do that. And when we can use them interchangeably between the parent studies and the extension trial, we love that even more. I can go on and on about how when technology works the way it's supposed to, how great of a benefit that it is to the site. That's why we want to use it. That's why we explore what's the next best thing. But it's unfortunately not always that way. When it works, it's great. When it doesn't work, it's a nightmare. It's just one or the other. So many extremes. There's no middle ground. We just have to make sure that we have the safeties and securities in place so that it always works, right? Yes. How do you think we can improve the utilization, adoption, and acceptance of tech stack expectations for our sites and clinical research? I mean, it really sounds simple, but don't just talk the talk. Show us. Come and shadow some of the issues. Have more feedback. Check in with your sites on a regular basis to see how is technology working for you and how is it working against you at this point. And really take that feedback and use it for the greater good. We're all going a million different directions in so many different aspects of clinical research right now. So I get that not a lot of people have a lot of extra time, especially CRAs and coordinators, to be providing this feedback. But I take that additional 10 minutes per study and fill out that questionnaire to say, hey, this is where this could be improved. And we know that it can be approved because this is what we've experienced. And this is the underbelly of how difficult everything has been. We want to provide this feedback in hopes that you'll take it and then pivot in a direction that makes it easier for both of us, which benefits both parties in the long run. It sounds like definitely sponsors or CROs or the vendors who develop this technology would benefit greatly from understanding the logistics of a site perspective, understanding what a site has to go through to use the technology. And even if they're solving a problem or if they're just causing more problems. But then on the other end, from the site's level, taking that initiative to speak up about the technology, it's a two-pronged approach. Many sites that I've talked to are honestly afraid. Have you ever been afraid of not getting the next study because you were a squeaky wheel? Yes, for sure. Probably if I'm being 100% transparent and a little bit even today, because I don't ever want to do anything that could be a bad backlash for myself, for my team, but we have to talk about the things that are sometimes uncomfortable in order to grow. We have to get to the nitty gritty of what is going on so we can become better. Because if we don't address those cracks in the system, what starts as like a fissure will end up becoming a chasm. Yeah. And so I'm willing to step outside of my comfort zone and say, hey, I'm not here to criticize. I'm not. I'm here to change. I'm here to address the elephant in the room and let's talk about what the challenges are for the site, which in turn is a challenge for the CRO and the sponsor. Let's talk about how we can learn from that, pivot and grow. I've had my share of criticizing things. From my experience, I've learned that there's a right and a wrong way to criticize. You absolutely do not
not want to point fingers specifically at someone or a company. You don't want someone to feel attacked as a result of your criticism. But you could accomplish the same thing and more if you focused solely on the problem, not at who was at fault or if there is a fault at all. But it's the problem. If we all focused on the problem and we all just came together and said, well, I can do this to fix it. And if you can do that to fix it, we can work together and get something better. It's much better for everyone involved. Take that as a life lesson from someone. They were angry at first and then they started to understand things and now they're trying to just make things better. Yes, you want to be part of the solution, not the problem. And sometimes the problem is putting up a guard or denying it or not having empathy to the people who are going through the experience. If I were to hand you the microphone right now and I said, what would you like to tell the entire industry about clinical research site tech stack expectations, what we can do about them and how we can improve, what would you tell them? Really tune into what I said just a few minutes ago. We plead with you to not only ask us on how your CRA is performing, but ask us how tech is performing for your site, how tech is performing for your participants and check in regularly. We know that there can be a solution. We might not know exactly what it is, but we know what it's not. Listen, be engaged in your listening and take the feedback you get, not with a defense, but rather an understanding that we're all coming together to try to solve a problem, right. which can also hold everyone accountable. And as a result, help our patients to have a far better experience in clinical trial performance. Yes. I love it. Well, Ashley, thanks so much for coming on to CRP and Central. I look forward to sharing this with the audience and at the live event that we're going to have afterwards. Oh my gosh, my pleasure, Dr. Fox. Thank you. And I hope everybody has a beautiful day. All right. I'll talk to you later. Bye-bye. Our next guest and his company are literally working so hard to accommodate sites that they hope to make clinical trials boring. Matt Smith is the Vice President of Research Site Development at Slope, an organization that offers a free sample logistic and tracking solution to clinical research sites. Together with Slope, Matt has advocated for years with sponsors and CROs the needs of sites and improvements we as an industry can adopt for better experiences. Matt is a critical voice of change and innovation in this industry, and I am so thankful he's taken the time to speak with us today. Please welcome with me, Mr. Matt Smith. Mr. Matt Smith, thank you so much for coming on to CRO. European Central today. Thanks, Dr. Fox. Really happy to be here. Thanks for the invite. Would you be willing to introduce yourself to the audience? I'm the Vice President of Research Site Development here at Slope. I get to be Santa Claus. We provide a free platform to sites to help them with better workflows for inventory sample management. The full chain of custody that includes the inventory, the samples, the biospecimen life cycle. We replace the look and see method for inventory, opening the cupboard, see what's there, quick close the cupboard before anything falls on you. We offer it for free as a workflow to the sites and make their lives easier. It stems from the idea that if you make life better for sites, everyone else is going to benefit. They're going to get better data. They're going to get it quicker. You have better data integrity. And there's so much top-down technology. The sites are doing a lot of duplicate data entry and it doesn't happen quickly. And there's going to be gaps in the data and a more chance for error. So sponsors have been burned on this in the past. They have questions about will sites even use technology? So by taking this ecosystem approach and why I get to play Santa Claus and we give this away to sites for free is that when the sponsor asks, will the sites even use this technology? Or is this just another piece of technology that they're going to begrudgingly use? Will they even use this? It's unfortunate they even have to ask it, but we're able to say not only will the sites use this, but a lot of them are already using this and not just on a couple of trials. They're using this as a workflow. We give this to them for free and that ecosystem allows them to use this across their entire portfolio of trials and make life a little bit easier. That is the key to what Slope is doing. Everyone's heard me talk about talk down tech. One of the hardest challenges with talk down tech, it is study specific. Sites have to sit there and develop a logistic around a single studies technology, which if you have 50 studies, that's where you have the duplicated effort. All of these logistics that are customized by study. The cool thing about Slope is they go to sites, sites choose to use it. And as a result, they can develop logistics around Slope for all of their studies, not just for a single one. That's the key. And I really do appreciate what Slope 
is doing here. I've watched Slope for years now. How are you doing? The future's so bright, we have to wear shades. <laughs> There's over 1,600 sites using the platform. We have 79% of the NCI designated cancer centers in the US, the biggest oncology centers out there, are using our platform in one way, shape, or form. The company's doing fantastic. Ecosystem approach. No wonder they call you Santa Claus. You bring magic and joy to sites everywhere. Today's topic is what we call tech stack expectations for our sites. As a clinical research site, and as you navigate through a global industry, those unspoken expectations about the adoption of technology. We all know that there are so many different options out there for technology, but when you start a research site, you don't necessarily know the expectation. You don't know what to start with. You might see all of these vendors, you might see all of these things, but you don't really know the standard. I'm going to ask you a series of questions, and I'm also going to ask these to an another individual. And we're going to compare your answers to the questions versus the answers of the individuals. And then we'll come back on a live event. We'll compare our answers and maybe do a little bit of a deep dive into understanding how we can develop these tech stack expectations for our front lines so that we can have better research for everyone. Fantastic. Let's do it. What do you think are the current tech stack expectations for our clinical research sites? I don't think it's an easy answer. It depends upon the expectations of the sponsor and internal as well. I don't think the expectations are technology so much as it is accurate data collection and efficiency. And what can you do to guarantee me as a, say a sponsor or CRO that you're going to be able to capture the data, do it quickly and accurately. If you're a new site, how do you quickly add in technology to answer that question? Well, we're eating about profit margins. I've spent a good chunk of my career working in site technology and also at the site. I usually recommend to sites that are just starting not to buy any technology. It's an upfront cost and you haven't generated any any revenue yet. In your first few trials, you can probably collect everything, do everything you need to a spreadsheets, paper, email, just have a good process, have a good defined system, some SOPs in place and how you're going to collect that. And where does it go? And how can you audit it? How do you know that for anything that's for your own internal use against site tech, how do you know that that was accurately collected and who did that? Don't take on an additional cost on technology until you hit a certain level of volume where it starts to create efficiencies of scale and there's risk reduction. Once you're at that level though, CTMS, depending upon the type of org, if you're a large research org, you probably have an EMR. Depends upon the type of site. If you're looking at a practice, healthcare network, something that has institutional platforms that they're required to use and clinical research is only a part of that, that's going to change your answer too. And if clinical research is lagging or it's a new endeavor for that organization, they're probably not going to have much of a voice on which systems they can use. Something that helps you manage the financials, CTMS, the visits, billing. When I say CTMS too, there's been this shift from just a standard CTMS to these traditional site CTMS platforms now offering additional solutions like e-reg, looking at opportunities to add that in and find one system that's going to be flexible enough. In addition to just being able to track the information, sites need to have preferences and standards on how they're doing things and what they prefer. Because otherwise, if you don't have an opinion, someone will give it to you. Sponsors, CROs will tell you, well, this is what you're going to use as a sponsor portal on the platform on this trial. And if you don't have an opinion on it, if you don't have preferences, then you're going to end up with something that maybe doesn't meet your needs or requires a lot of additional work that you might not be compensated for. If I were a beginning site, you really don't want to sink expense into anything that you can't afford quite yet. So you can do a lot of research on spreadsheets. There's entire hospitals that still, as we talk, do research on spreadsheets. But on the site side, internally as a site, your expectations to hold a tech load, so to speak, you'd have some form of spreadsheet, probably going to have to have a word processing center, something like that, storage, email. That's all tech that we do just as a general business. But then there are so many free options now for tech, such as Slope for sample management. You've got the Vivas of the world for free e-reg, Viva Vault. And then you're dabbling into CTMS, e-source, patient recruitment, trial recruitment, trial expectations, all these things on the site side where sites are selecting the technology. The other side of the equation are things that sites cannot control. Let's say a sponsor comes to me and as they do feasibility, they say, do you have experience in this EDC? Do you have experience with this ECOA? Oh, by the way, we use this vendor for payments. Can you get into that payment portal? Do you have this vendor for home health? We want to do home health. All of these different portals, pathways. Now they're trying to do single sign-ons where you're bundling it all together. That's where it gets blurry. Since sites have so many sponsor expectations on tech stacks, they are very hesitant to create their own tech stack because what if the sponsors don't approve those? Then they're going to have to do double the work. Yeah. When we think about it historically, it definitely fell into one category or the other. There was site tech 
technology and the response are technology. And site technology usually was not great. When we think about any development company that was out there, if they're providing solutions for sites and then also building tech for sponsors, site budgets are a fraction of what sponsors are. And when we think about the revenue potential from a site versus a sponsor, it's clear to see why so many of these technology providers were putting all of their eggs into the sponsor development stack. This is baseline foundational issue with the industry. We see all of the resources going into technology for the sponsors and not into the sites. And they fell into one bucket or the other. Site technology grew out of a need. And a lot of those solutions that are out there actually were from people that worked at the site that were frustrated with the lack of solutions. It was very organic. Whereas so much technology from the sponsor side was driven around the desire of selling to the sponsor, differentiating what does the sponsor want to see without thinking about the site needs or the user experience. What we're seeing now is the ship. I just came across this metric in the last four years. We've seen sponsor interest in being a sponsor of choice from 14% to 65%. To me, that speaks of this reshift, this balance where the sites now have more power than they did before. There's greater trial complexity, meaning you need sites that really know what they're doing and there's consolidation. So it's a lot easier for sites to know how do they stack up and make more demands and they're churning trials away if they're not a good fit. So this has leveled the playing field a bit for them to be able to say, we want to use our own technology. We want you to integrate with it. And they're pushing that back on the sponsor. I kind of feel for the sponsor in some of these instances. They're given technology from vendors that traditionally was very sponsor centric and the sponsor is the one getting hit over the head with it, that it doesn't meet the site's needs. We're getting away from this idea of it having to be sponsor tech or site tech and more of this ecosystem approach. And a lot of it is by demand. Nothing happens quickly, but my favorite saying, we're an industry of innovation as long as nothing changes. Perfect. It fits so well into this industry, Matt. And when we think about this too, as it relates to ecosystem approach and adoption, the old way was fine for a lot of providers, a lot of sponsors, because they were getting most of what they needed out of it and it worked well enough. But as sites are having more power, having their moment right now and able to say, we need better. And we also see regulation changes, FDA and more of a push to decentralize remote work. We need more digital systems. This is driving a lot of change. And I think we're starting to see this shift towards those ecosystems. It's now more ambiguity as far as, well, it might be a sponsor system, but there's also the option for it to benefit the site and maybe more of a push into that direction where the site is benefiting. And this is the slope model too. Let's offer it as not just technology that they can use in a couple of trials at the site, but it's part of their workflow. Build their logistic, make an SOP around it. We see this too, that slope is put in place as an SOP at the site, that this is what we use. And then they're going to push that to the sponsor to say, here's what we're using. And if you look at the benefit to you, it's actually going to be a lean supply chain, save you money, guarantee that there's no visit deviations due to inventory. It benefits everyone. What are the challenges that we face with current stack expectations? So we saw this initial shift with the industry where there was very manual paper processes and we had the lift, which was to make digital technology solutions. So we went from paper spreadsheets to EDC. That was the lift. Same thing when we think about site CTMS and a lot of these solutions were siloed. They did one thing, but they did it instead of manually, they made it digital. It was now a technology solution, but it did one thing. Now what we tend to see is the shift. So those solutions now are maturing and maybe through acquisition or development, they're starting to add in ancillary solutions and modules that help out. That's what we're seeing this monumental shift towards is the lift and then the shift solution for sites. But the challenges here where you still have these very separate systems that didn't talk to each other, required a lot of duplicate data entry. And that also encompasses the site tech and the sponsor tech. We see on average a site having to use 15 to 20 different pieces of technology in a given day across all of their trials. That's too much. And how do you keep it all straight? How do you know you have to use this platform here or there? So, hey, let's start integrating. And initially those integrations were very manual and required a lot of time and a lot of investment, primarily from the sites that had to take that on. We want an EMR EDC integration. Well, that's going to be trial by trial, potentially an investment you have to do every time. Or two third-party systems that the site would prefer that they talk to or sponsor wanting to integrate with some of the site tech. Those manual processes then were efficient, but they were very slow. And it was a case by case, study by study basis. We improved on that. Hey, we have open APIs and now we have the ability to take these 10, 20 data points and anyone can use them and pull those in. And maybe we even consume some data. It's a bi-directional flow of data. And we pat ourselves on the back as an industry and say, we've arrived. We now allow anyone to consume this data and maybe we'll even receive some of that in. The challenge is that the API for the most part doesn't go far enough. It's allowed tech companies to get a little complacent because you offer up 10 data points, but the challenge is 
we need two more that are not part of your API. And we're kind of stuck. And because we are able to point to as an industry and say, hey, here's these data points and we're flexible. We work with anyone. We want to help out. We don't find out until later that it doesn't go far enough. We've kind of put up these barriers by trying to be flexible. My question is, what is this next step though? This is a big barrier. We have some integrations, but they probably don't go far enough. And are those solutions, those integrations, something that are done across a workflow system that's going to hold up regardless of which trial it is that the site is running? This integration is in place for every trial, or more likely it's an issue and integration that has to be done on every single trial, which drives the cost and the time and is a really big barrier. Restrictions on data. What can we share? What can't we share? PHI, maybe information from the site EMR that's going to flow into another system. How do we control which data is flowing out? How do we make sure that that's blinded, that there is no opportunity for any PHI to make its way into the system? There's all of these regulations that are there for a good reason. And we have to acknowledge that and think about how do we set this up to streamline, make it efficient while having security around our data integrity. So I was just having this conversation with a very close friend of mine. We as an industry can have all of the open API that we want. Everyone can say, oh yeah, we're open API. But the ability to map those data, to map those programs together is where we're limited. And here's why. Were you affected by the giant blue screen of death that just happened for the entire world pretty much? Yeah. All the giant big blue screens with frowny faces? Yeah. I was actually in the airport when that happened last week. Great example. It's the perfect example. One vendor made a change and tried to update and crash an entire system. The vendors are not on a lined up update schedule. They all update all the time. And if you don't map out those programs as you integrate, every time someone updates, they break the link and all of a sudden you're gone. So you're going to have to have continuous mapping if you want to face that challenge of not only open API and integration, not only the information exchange, but also the ability to update an entire industry. Yeah, that's a great point. And obviously it's not just in research. You could be doing everything right as a technology company too, or as a site with your data and export, but somebody else that you are reliant on for data import or export, they could have an issue. And like the blue screen of death issue with all the travel, you're totally at the mercy of everyone that you've integrated with. I can see a future and mark my words, we're kind of seeing it in a little bit. You know, when you go to a store and you see on the store, there's a sticker that says, we accept this credit card or that credit card. That's a communication between a vendor and a consumer that, hey, these are the processes that we adopt, that we have at this store. And then the consumer comes in and says, oh, I have a credit card that aligns with the processes of this store. So now I can make a transaction at this store. I can see a future where it can be on a feasibility. I can say, what is your tech stack? Let's select the tech stack that our sponsors are aligned to. I can see a world where that's a thing. Absolutely. That way nobody has to literally invent a logistic around a single study but rather they're making the site selection based off of the tech stacks that are already developed. Absolutely. You think about a trial that's going to run the gamut of small sites that might be independent. They're just doing clinical research up to healthcare networks that are also doing clinical research. Their systems that they're using might have some overlap, but probably not a lot. And there's no way that a sponsor is going to be able to force those large healthcare networks to use their systems, their sponsored platforms. And we are seeing a shift away from that as well. We know that sites have different technologies that they're using rather than trying to force new technology on them from the top down. You're absolutely right. It makes so much more sense to offer up a flexible integration option to be able to use that site's existing technology and pull in that data to the sponsor. It's going to reduce duplicate data entry. Data integrity is going to be in place. You're not going to have those errors. That's the solution, but it needs to be flexible. And guess what? It's already integrated into the system. How many large global pharmaceutical companies have SOPs on vendor selection? Oh, it's already there, right? All you have to do is follow those SOPs on sites, align with ISO 9000 standards, identify their technology and vet them. You're going to have this opportunity. What are the benefits of the industry's current tech stack expectations? Expectations are evolving and there's more people willing to listen because it's impacting them. The challenge is when you think about expectations, whose expectations? Because they differ. Sponsor expectations on technology might be completely different. And when we say sponsor expectations, that likely is coming from other parties involved. The sponsor is the one that ends up with the responsibility because they're the one paying for it. But those expectations might come from a CRO and their preferences and probably input from the lab that the CRO is working with and what they're set up to do and their own internal tech systems that they have in place. Expectations are not always based upon what maybe even rarely, that's a sad thought, what's actually best for the trial. And 
there's other factors at play. We could really benefit as an industry if the sponsor, if they have like a chief value officer who's in place of looking at the trial conduct, not just a silo, but the opportunity to look at the entire value chain of what is the sponsor and their vendors providing and asking of the sites to say, hey, starting with feasibility, here's the information we're asking. Do we already have that information on the site? Reduce the duplicity. Absolutely. Yeah. Looking at this holistically rather than the silo, the sum of the parts, we tend to do that as an industry, but there's so much value in really taking a step back and looking at it again as an ecosystem. There's a common theme popping up again. From a site's perspective, let's say you're at this super duper large hospital, a nonprofit of sorts, you have all kinds of money, you can afford the technology versus the mom and pop site who just barely, they made it this their first trial, they don't have a lot of money to work on. The ability to provide this kind of technology on a study wide level, there's a reason why it's happening. It's so that sponsors can standardize the quality of the data that they're collecting. They could streamline their processes. So if you look at those extremes, it makes it so that they're all performing the research on the same playing field. Maybe that's the logic behind it. Absolutely agree. And I would add a caveat, offer it as an option, but don't make it a requirement. Yeah. The requirement should be that we receive the data in this format within these parameters. We want it quick. We want it accurate. We want to be able to trace it. Let's not worry so much about the system. Those large healthcare networks that we talked about, they probably have something in place already and they prefer that. And you want that data quickly, integrate with their system, offer the opportunity to upload that data from their current system into your system. Mom and pop site that doesn't have anything in place and they're more than happy to use that maybe just out of an absence of options that they will use that sponsor tech option. That's great for them on that trial. It's kind of like having lawyers. If you are arrested, you have the right to a public attorney. So it's better than nothing. You're going to get some kind of a representation, but maybe you want your lawyer. Maybe you want the lawyer that knows your story that you've already developed a relationship with. Yeah, that is an accurate and painful analogy. <laughs> I think that that makes a lot of sense. How may we improve the utilization, adoption, and acceptance of tech stack expectations? When we think about expectations, we just need to ask. What's really puzzling to me is the lack of interest in talking to the sites, or maybe even just the lack of follow through. Sites are your canary in a coal mine. They allow you to quickly understand the viability of your trial workflow. Here's how we're thinking about setting this up. Here's the technology solutions that we're exploring using on this trial. What are you currently doing for this? We need more of that. We need more conversations to understand the impact of the site. What is that user experience? If I were to give you the microphone right now, and I said, what would you like to tell this entire industry about site tech stacks and the expectations of sites and how we can improve that for communication and more streamlined research? What would you tell them? Ask a lot of questions of everyone, of all the players involved, especially if you are responsible for picking technology to use on a trial or even from a site standpoint. Are you looking at how this impacts the end users? From a site side, we see a lot of technology decisions being made by people that will not be using that technology. Just look at all of the players. Look at the overall user experience of everyone that's involved. And then how can we offer some flexibility and some options? Ask the questions, listen, be flexible, follow through on those questions questions. Don't just check off a box because you asked a question and then discard it in the shredder. Actually do something with it. And maybe if we included all of the stakeholders at the appropriate ratio, we would be able to create that ecosystem of technology that would allow everyone to enhance what they do in clinical research. Sounds easy enough, right? What's really sad is that that's a unique thought. It seems pretty straightforward, but it's very, very challenging to implement. We're making good progress. I'm really optimistic about what this looks like going forward. I am too. And I have seen it change so much. It has absolutely revolutionized in the past four years. I can only imagine what it's going to do in the next four years. Matt, thank you so much for coming on to CRP and Central today. It was an honor to have you here. I highly recommend everyone check out Slope. They're doing it right. And we'll see you at the live event. Thanks, Dr. Fox. Thanks for having me on. All right. Talk to you later. Thanks. Bye. Ashley has worked across spectrums of the industry for many years. Now, at Arizona Neuroscience, she is not only working on the front lines to make sure her studies are performed at their best, but she is also ensuring her site is fully compliant and financially responsible with budgets, books, and payment collections. 
Processes have changed dramatically since Ashley started at her site, from implementation of e-reg to 24-7 temperature monitoring and alarms. And as she continues to look for the best solutions to streamline her site's operations, sponsors are moving into a world of expectations that include continuous information exchange and, as a result, increased quality standard expectations. Sites are overwhelmed constantly with portal logins and study-specific technology burden. And while it's great when it works, troubleshooting is particularly challenging challenging when sites are not in control, they're dependent on others, and they are blamed for the errors of third-party vendors. It's exhausting working in a broken system with bad tech, almost to the point where sites will eventually just say no and select the trial solely by a sponsor's chosen tech stack. And if everyone takes the time to ask questions, speak up, and follow through to improve those uncomfortable situations, not criticize, we may work to be a part of the solution for improved future site experiences. Matt has worked in the industry as a leading site advocate for many years. Now, at Slope, he gets to be Santa Claus, ho ho ho, as he brings the gift of free lab workflows to sites not as a cumbersome point solution for a single study, but rather in an ecosystem approach to make site lives better and, as a result, enhance success for the entire industry. Sponsor expectations are not necessarily technology-driven, but rather focus more on accuracy and efficiency of data delivery, and a site should seriously set its own technology standard, or it will ultimately be told what the standards are from industry counterparts. This is an industry of innovation, as long as nothing changes. However, we see a continuing increase in sponsors who want to be the preferred sponsor to sites, which is creating a balance of input throughout the industry's lifts and electronic adoption and shifts and integration. If sponsors want quick and quality data, it would be far more efficient to integrate into site technology instead of imposing unfamiliar solutions on our industry's trial practitioners. And if we ask a lot of questions from the relevant stakeholders, we listen with intent, and we act on stakeholder recommendations, the industry may be on its way toward ecosystem improvements that may actually impact study operations for everyone involved. Both of today's guests confirmed site tech stacks are currently burdened and inefficient on the front lines, and both of our guests emphasized the importance of providing well-intended feedback to sponsors for improved technology. And while Ashley highlighted the wasted time to patients and physicians and the catastrophic consequences of failed technology, Matt discussed the cumbersome impact of siloed study-specific point solutions that do not contribute to ecosystem approaches. So how may we improve the utilization of tech stack expectations for our clinical research sites? Combined, our guests align their answers into three distinct principles. To optimize tech stacks at our sites, we must focus closely on communication, flexibility, and courage. Ask questions and provide honest feedback with an objective to improve. Collaborate with each other, not to tailor processes to a study, but rather to integrate into a site's established ecosystem of workflows. And have the courage to speak up about the uncomfortable topics not as a power trip or an act of aggression but rather to solve the problems that haunt our sites, our sponsors, and importantly, our participants. Thank you for tuning in to today's Tech Stack Expectations episode. Solving Tech Stack challenges is possible. However, we as an industry must work together in collaboration and understanding. It doesn't matter if you are a site, a sponsor, or a CRO. Please speak up when things go wrong to prevent the same errors from occurring in the future. Thank you to Ashley and Matt for sharing their stories with us today. Thank you to Mitch Hilby and his amazing talent on jenny.lovo.ai for volunteering in today's CRP in short. Finally, thank you to my CRP in Central sponsors for making this podcast possible. Thank you again for listening, and we'll see you next time on CRP in Central.